Good morning. I know this is, uh, I'm going to pull back a little bit of you know, my youth, youth ministry days, but uh, why don't we just turn to one another and just say to each other, as genuinely as possible, I'm glad you're here. Just turn it, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're here. <clears throat> well, let me uh, be maybe speed myself over and say thank you to Pastor Barry and Pastor Cole for their generosity in letting me share with you this morning. A lot has changed since I was in this building last. Um, like Pastor Barry mentioned, uh, my wife and I have a son, Elias, 16 months old. Uh, he owns the house. We don't own the house anymore. Um, and if you can tell from my voice, I'm, I'm getting over my first cold that I inherited from him. Um, so parents, you know, once you have the kid, anything that they get, you get. Uh, so that's, a, that's a now a, a reality uh, in my life right now. Why don't we open our Bibles or turn them on to Luke chapter 1. So open your Bibles uh, to Luke chapter 1. And as we turn there, I'm just going to uh, share a piece of just a lesson that I've learned in being, speaking of uh, in being a new parent, uh, something that I learned, have been learning over the past year as a new parent. Uh, before Elias was born, I had people always tell me, uh, hey, you need to be aware of what you do. When you have a kid, you need to be aware of what you do in front of him. Because whatever it is you do, whatever it is you say, even if you aren't teaching someone, even if you aren't showing them, they're going to pick up what you do. They're going to copy you. They're going to basically do what you do. So if you, you know, if you're kind of loose with your language, they're going to pick up those words. They might not know what they mean, but they'll pick up those words. If you're, you know, if you do certain things in certain ways, if you like to put things in certain places, they will also put those things in those places. They will follow you around. And I was like, what? This doesn't make any sense. Like, how does, how does this baby know, like, what's going on? Uh, the, he's just like a blob, just lying there, right? Like, what, what, is, what is he going to do? How does he understand what's going on in this, like, incredibly complex adult brain of mine and why I do what I do and all these important things I'm doing? But in any case, you know, I've been taking care of Elias, and it, it dawned on me that he's been picking up things that I've been doing. And, and in one of those moments I have here on a video. So, so there he is, right by the door. And you see how he's walking? I didn't teach him that. I did never, I never, I never showed him, Elias, this is how you should walk around the house. See? Hands clasped behind your back. Slight tilt forward, walking this way. You ready? You old man walk? There he is. I didn't teach him this either, but I don't do this. No, thank he goes you. digging in the trash and stuff. No, thank you. No, thank you. But in any no, case, thank you. yeah. From the youngest age, we learn by looking at others. We learn by watching others, even subconsciously, right? This is totally natural. This is not something that Elias ever learned in school or even learned from me or Dawn. He just knew. I learned by looking. I learn by seeing how other people are living. We follow examples and patterns, mostly people in our lives, people we know, our parents, our friends. And we do this for almost all the areas of our life. What does it mean to be successful or great in what we do? We can say, oh, it means to get this grade or get this salary or get this position. But we usually have a person in our mind. This is who I want to be like. This is the person that sets the standard for me. This is my hero. This is my, you know, my role model. When people interview great artists or famous people, they ask, who are your greatest influences? And a lot of these people have a whole laundry list of, of influences, people they want to be like too. And how, but what about our lives as followers of Jesus? Who are the examples and patterns of faith that we look at for our lives? Maybe it's a pastor a friend, a leader, or a parent, maybe a famous person from history or a popular artist or teacher. But 
in my experience, too often, people have struggled in their faith they, because we create these expectations for ourselves and what we're supposed to be as Christians and how it's supposed to look. We create these expectations that, that are impossibly high or aren't necessarily even from the Bible. We feel like we don't pray enough. We don't serve enough. We don't do enough for God. Maybe we look at our lives and think, I'm not going to be a pastor or a missionary. So what does it mean to live a life of faith, to be a follower of Jesus? How is my life supposed to look? Is following Jesus, I'm being totally blunt with you, especially for youth group kids, right? I'm just totally blunt with you. Is, is Christianity, is this following Jesus thing just about coming to FNF, coming to church, doing churchy things, doing Christian-y things? Is that all it's about? Is that really what defines what it means to be a follower of Jesus? So that's the big question that we're going to be looking at today. What is a life of faith supposed to look like? What is a life of faith supposed to look like? So we're going to take that question, and let me pray for us very quickly, and then we will dive into the word today. Let me pray for us. God, we ask that you would open our hearts and our minds to what you have to speak to us today. Give us an understanding of what it means to be a a follower of Jesus, to live in faith, by faith, in you. May the meditations of my heart be pleasing to you, O God, my rock and my redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So the passage that was read just before by Pastor Barry so eloquently uh, is Luke 2, 1 through 21. And this is the Christmas story. Now you're thinking, okay, are we going to talk about Christmas today? Yes and no. Actually, the reason why I had this story read is because it is the foundation for what we're going to be talking about today. We're actually going to be talking not about the Christmas story itself, but about the broader narrative that surrounds the Christmas story in Luke 1 and 2. You see, Luke writes... Um, uh, write, writes these two chapters called the birth narrative. And within these birth narratives, Jesus as a character actually doesn't get a lot of screen time. I mean, Jesus is anticipated, he's announced, and then he's born, and then he's circumcised, and he kind of pops up towards the end of chapter 2 there as a, as a speaking character. But throughout most of Luke 1 and 2, these birth narratives, there's actually, Jesus isn't actually an active player character in the story. No, actually, Luke tells the story of Jesus' birth through the eyes of a diverse and very unexpected group of characters. Not just to give us information about Jesus' birth, of course, to record what happened, of course, but these characters, these narratives around Jesus' birth are meant to show us, I believe, what faith in Jesus looks like. Because in these characters, they're all responding to the message about Jesus, his coming into the world, and his mission in the world. You see, in these narratives in Luke 1 and 2, with all of these many characters, Luke is giving us different patterns of faith to look at, different kinds of people to look at, so that we can see one of these characters and say, hey, I understand where this character is coming from. I understand where this person is coming from. And we can see ourselves in them. And in, them, in seeing ourselves in them, we learn what faith looks like for them and even for us. So that's what we're going to be looking at today. And so I want you to keep your Bibles open. We're going to be jumping through Luke 1 and Luke 2. And we're going to be looking at three sets of characters. Three sets of characters. Three pairs of characters uh, that Luke puts together. Uh, first pair will be Zechariah and Mary. Second is Mary and Elizabeth. And third is Anna and Simeon. And through these three pairings, we'll come to understand what does it mean to live a life of faith and what is that supposed to look like? So the first pairing, Zechariah and Mary. Now it starts at the, be- at, the, at the beginning of Luke chapter 1. You have these first the story of this man named Zechariah followed by the story about Mary. Now, who are these characters? Who's Zechariah? Zechariah is a priest, an older man. 
he's someone, and read in chapter 1, verse 5, that him and his wife were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord, but they had no child because Elizabeth, Zechariah's wife, was barren, unable to have children, and they were both advanced in years. So the first person that we meet in Luke's birth story about Jesus is Zechariah, an old priest, someone who has been doing his job, serving God in the inner and around the temple for his life. And unfortunately, he has not, he and his wife, though faithful as they have been, have not been able to have a child. Now, back in these times, that would have been a cause for scandal or suspicion. Because many people would have thought, the reason why God has not given them a child is because they have done something wrong. It's because they have somehow, some way, broken faith with God, and so God has not seen it fit to give them a child, especially a son. So Zechariah, though, we hear from Luke, he's a faithful priest. He's faithfully serving God, walking blamelessly, Luke says, before the Lord. And yet, old man as he is, is probably distraught or a little bitter, wondering, when, why, Lord, why have we not been given a child? And who is Mary? So Mary is a familiar character to us. We read in chapter 1, verse 26, that Mary was a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. Now, during that time, the way that things worked was that marriages were made between two families. And so when two families came together, usually uh, at, at a younger age, many of you who are around 15 or 16 is when marriages would start to be arranged during that time, the two families would come together and a betrothal was basically like you were already, almost already married. So Mary and Joseph were committed to each other, ready to be married, but obviously she had not been with, uh, with Joseph intimately and she was a virgin, uh, a young girl of no more than 15 or 16 with her whole life ahead of her. Right, with the, the, the dawn of a new family ahead of her. You could not find more different characters. Zechariah on one end, old man, probably a little bit tired, faithfully serving God his whole life. And young Mary, at the beginning of her life, ready to start her family, ready to move on into adulthood, to do her own thing with her husband. Now, what draws them together? Why does Luke draw them together? Well, because both of these characters, Zechariah and Mary, receive an unexpected message from God. In chapter 1, verses 11 through 13, we find Zechariah in the temple. He is serving God in the temple and, and, and putting incense on the altar. And as he's doing that, an angel appears to Zechariah and says in, chapter, in verse 11, in, in, in verse 11, there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to Zechariah, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. And your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. Can you imagine hearing that? After years and years of prayers, seeming silence, just serving God every day, doing, going about his business. Finally, Zechariah hears this from an, an angel, no less. And Mary, similarly, in chapter 1, verses 28 through 31, the angel comes to her and says, verse 28, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. And just like Zechariah, Mary was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, don't be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your heart and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. So Zechariah and Mary both get an unexpected message out of the blue from an angel. Two different people, but a very similar message. How do they react? Zechariah's reaction is unbelief. Zechariah says to the angel, verse 18, how shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife is advanced in years. In verse 20, the angel tells Zechariah that because he did not believe the angel, that Zechariah would not be able to speak until the birth of his son. 
But there's something very interesting here we see with Mary's reaction, this, this reaction of faith. In chapter 1, verse 34, in response to the angel, Mary actually asks the same question as Zechariah. She asks, how will this be since I am a virgin? It is a valid question. Zechariah asks, how, will, how, will, how, how is this going to happen? My wife and I are old. Perfectly valid question. Mary asks, how will this be? I am a virgin. That's a valid question. These things don't usually happen. Now, what we don't see here in the text, what's not told to us explicitly, is that the, the angel sees more than just the question. But the angel sees the heart behind the question for Zechariah and for Mary. You see, they're both asking the same question, but the difference is not in the question itself. It's where the question is coming from. The angel saw that Zechariah, when he asked that question, was not asking out of faith. He was not asking out of trust in God. Whereas Mary was, and we see that later on, where she even says, may it be to me according to your words. See, this is the first lesson that we see from this first set of characters, that faith is trusting God. Faith trusts God when it's hard to understand. Faith trusts God when it's hard to understand. The trusting God is not blind faith. It's not living as if nothing is wrong. But a life of faith is driven out of a trust, a deep abiding trust in God, in his goodness and his faithfulness. And even if we can't quite understand how things will happen, even if we don't know, even if things don't quite make sense to us, we can trust God. And even if we have questions, those questions come from a desire to trust God, come from a place of trusting in God. And so then we genuinely bring those questions to God, and he will give us an answer. Trusting God means that we continue to live for him in whatever we do even if we don't fully understand everything at all times. It's very similar to the way that a lot of us grow up. You know, we, we don't understand everything, and we depend on our parents for so much, especially when we're young. And as we grow older and older and older, we begin to understand more and more and more, and maybe we become, you know, we start to differ from our parents. Even if we differ from our parents, or we don't understand what our parents are saying, if there is a good relation, if you have a good relationship with your parents, then you can know that you can ask them a question, and they and and it's coming from a place of trust. It's coming from a place where you want to learn and you want to build that relationship. And that's the same kind of faith that we need to have with God. That we need to trust Him, even when we don't understand everything that's going on in our lives, even if we don't understand why anything is happening to us at any one moment. God is good. He's working for our good. And so we can trust him. It also means we can come to God with any question. He's not afraid of your questions. God is not looking for someone who doesn't, who, 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 just, blindly, who just blindly follows without truly understanding. And so God is wanting us to bring our questions to him. And that's the kind of faith that we need to have is to trust God. So that's what we see in Zechariah and Mary. Now the second pair, Mary and Elizabeth. Who are they? Well, we've already met Mary. Mary, this young, this young woman who is now pregnant uh, with her son, Jesus. Now, who is Elizabeth? Elizabeth, we see, mentioned in uh, chapter 1, verse 5, Zechariah's wife. Now, Elizabeth is Mary's cousin. Now, this cousin is just kind of a, a familial term. There are probably not first cousins and things like that because Elizabeth was much older. So they, they are probably related by family somehow. But you know, what, the struggle of, for Elizabeth was that she could not bear children. She was what's called barren for many years. And though not much is said here about her and her struggle, like I said, during that time, it would have not just been a matter of if they could have kids or not, but it would have been something that was caused a lot of social and personal anxiety. 
a lot of spiritual questioning. Elizabeth may have struggled with her own relationship with God. She may have seen God work in other people's lives, seen other people have children, and thought, I, why can't I have children? Why not me, Lord? I'm as faithful to you as anyone else. Now what draws together Mary, this young mother, and Elizabeth, this older first-time mother? Well, an unexpected work of God is what draws them together. Two impossible pregnancies, right? A virgin birth and the birth of a woman who is far beyond childbearing age. Now what we see is incredible in this work. You know, we see God bring life new life. And I think it's a, it's a beautiful thing when we see Mary and Elizabeth come together in chapter 1, verse 41. And Elizabeth hears Mary coming to, coming to her home. And upon hearing the greeting of Mary, the baby within Elizabeth's womb leapt, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is it granted to me that the mother of my Lord to come to me, for behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. See, Elizabeth's reaction to seeing what's going on in Mary's life and in her life is joy. is joyous worship and encouragement and praise. Praise to God, encouragement of Mary for what God is doing in her life. And Mary's response is later, right after Elizabeth's response in what's called the Magnificat or Mary's Song. And that starts with Mary saying, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. Faith rejoices in God's work in others, even as we celebrate his work in our own lives. Faith, a life of faith rejoices in what God is doing in others, even as he celebrates his work in our own lives. And I think that's so important now for our day and age. A day and age, the church is so divided over so many different issues. We've made so many different uh, dividing lines us. And we've, we've ceased to rejoice in the good things that God is doing in each of our lives. Look to the person to your right and your left. Look at the person behind you. God is doing someone in that person's life. Now, if we change the way that we looked at people, if we change the way that we understood how, uh, how God is working in people's lives, if we were less concerned with, why don't I have this, or why don't I have that? And more concerned with how God is working in others, and seeing that, and celebrating that, and rejoicing in that. I believe that it would bring greater unity to the church. It would be able at least to help us to understand and see each other with eyes of love, with the same eyes that God sees us with. And our ability to do that, to rejoice, not just in what God is doing in our lives, but what God is doing in the other person's lives, they are built up too. And then they too can be empowered and strengthened to build up others. So as we look at this, right, we see two different characters, Mary and Elizabeth, both incredibly blessed. But their, their focus is not just you know, all on me, on me, but it's on what God is doing. And for Elizabeth, she encourages and blesses Mary. I think that's where we need to do for each other as we share in what God is doing in each of our lives. We need to bless each other. We need to speak these sweet words of blessing and rejoice together as brothers and sisters in Christ. So we've seen that faith, faith trusts God even when it's hard to understand. Faith rejoices in God's work in others even as we celebrate his work in our own lives. Lastly, we look at Anna and Simeon. Anna and Simeon. 
So who are Anna and Simeon? This is now moving on to Luke chapter 2. We're going to look starting in verse 36. And we see, uh, we're going to first start with Anna. Now Anna, uh, it says in the text that she was in years, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin. So she got married. She was married to her husband for seven years. And then as a widow until she was 84. So she lost her husband after seven years and never remarried again. She did not depart from the temple, worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day. So Anna is someone who was where Mary was. She was married and then lost her husband, seemingly didn't have a family. And then until she was 84, dedicated her life to serving God in the temple. Who's Simeon? Further up in chapter 2, verse 25, we read, There was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. That, that phrase there means waiting for God to fulfill his promises to his people. So Simeon's a guy who's been waiting for God to fulfill his promises to his people. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Two very different people here. We don't know about Simeon's background too much, but we know that he was someone who was righteous and devout in his life, waiting for God to fulfill his promises. And Anna was someone <clears throat> who had been waiting ever since she had lost her husband, had dedicated her life to serving God and waiting for God in the temple. What draws them together? It's this unexpect, it's unexpected time of waiting on God. Anna comes from this place where she's had to wait since she's lost her husband. Simeon, we don't know how long he's been waiting. But they're both waiting for God to work. They're waiting for God to do something. Now when they see Jesus come into the temple, what's their reaction? Simeon's reaction in verse 29, chap chapter 2, verse 29. Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all the people. Anna's reaction to seeing Jesus, chapter 2, verse 38. Coming upon that very hour, she began to give thanks to God and to speak of Jesus, him, who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. Faith through these characters, we see faith that believes that God will fulfill his promises even when it seems like they won't happen. Faith believes that God will fulfill his promises even when it seems like they won't happen. I think this is something that many of us live with. Even with you guys in junior high school and high school, you live with this sense of anticipation. Okay, when you're in sixth grade, you want to be in seventh grade because you don't want to be at the bottom of the, bottom of the the, the latter, right? When you're seventh and eighth grade, you're like, man, I got this, I got this down now, right? Then you go to high school, boom, back to the bottom of the ladder, right? You go all the way up, and now some of you guys who are like, I knew you guys in sixth grade, and now you're seniors, and I'm like, what? Um, you guys are getting ready at the top of the ladder, you're getting ready to move on to college. And when you, some of y'all are in college, and you've, you've got graduated from college, and, and you're like me, you're like, I can't, I can't get enough of school. So, uh, you know, you go to grade, grad school and you know, things like that. And we, we, we want this promise fulfilled. There's always a promise that's, that something better is coming, right? We look for that in our lives. For some of us, we look for that in our schooling. For some of us, we look for that in our jobs. For some of us, we look for that in our families even. We look for that in the broken relationships we have. We go you know what, I had a broken relationship with this person, you know what, the next time it will be better. And so we, we live our lives kind of going from thing to thing and looking forward to something greater, trying to hold on to a hope that there will be something better. But none of those things, none of those things ultimately will fulfill us the way that God's promises fulfill us. His through Christ, his promise of eternal life, his promise of presence in our lives, the way that he is working in us. 
And I think that's where you often struggle. You really do struggle to see and understand what it means to, to live for God. Because we don't see God working and fulfilling his promises in our lives as, as much as we would like. But faith believes that God will ultimately fulfill his promises, even when it seems like they won't happen. And how do we know this ultimately? Because he gave us Jesus. And that's really the most important thing here. That all of these characters are back to Jesus as the center. Jesus as the ground of faith. Each of these characters, Zechariah, Mary, Elizabeth, Anna, Simeon, are looking forward and pointing us forward to Jesus. When it's hard to understand life, we look at Jesus, the Son of God who became a human being. In Jesus, we see that God is good and he cares for us. When we look at what God is doing in our lives and in the world, we're reminded that it is because of Jesus and what Jesus has done. And that Jesus gave up his life for us. We've received the greatest lesson already in Jesus Christ. And this should help us to rejoice and encourage and build up each other. We may be in a situation where we feel like God has abandoned us or his promises are not true. Or that God's promises don't really matter to where we are. But in Jesus we see that God has already fulfilled his promises to save his people in Jesus, we have assurance that God will be faithful to fulfill his promises tomorrow and all the way into eternity. That Christ will come again. And that the eternal life that he's given to us, we will see with our own eyes. So faith. What is this faith that, that we see through the characters in this narrative? Lived out. A faith that trusts God even when it's hard to understand. A faith that rejoices in God's work in ourselves and in others. And a faith that believes that God will fulfill his promises, even when it seems like they won't happen. So just a couple of practical reminders as we think about how this shapes out in our lives. First thing is this. Your faith will look different than others, and that's okay. Each of us are in different stages and places in life. And we have different experiences, personalities, and gifts. Living in faith today for you, may look a little bit different than what it looks like in five years or ten years. Those of us here who are a little older know, you know, we live out our faith may change over time, dependent upon our circumstances. But even though the practical outside situations change, the heart remains the same. And God will continue to be with us. Your faith may waver at times. Each of us has questions and doubts. Even Zechariah. Serving God all those years had his own questions and doubts. And when we have these moments, we need to remember that it's okay. That God sees us in our doubt and in our fear and doesn't condemn us, but wants us to come to him. In faith, in trust, with the questions, hurt, with the whys, with the crying, with the tears, with the sense of disappointment. God wants you to come to him. God is not afraid of your questions or of your fear or of your anxiety. God is not afraid of any of these things. And he honors them if we come to him in trust. Third thing to remember is you are not alone. What we see from all these characters is that they struggle in different ways. They face different challenges. They find themselves in different difficult situations. Just like you and me. So we are not alone. They are not alone. The people beside you, our church family here, we are not alone. As we try to live faithfully for Jesus, we have each other. God has given to us a family here at this church to build us up, to help us, to encourage us, to share with us, to hold us up when we can't hold up ourselves. And lastly, your faith, you have seen, all of you, are seen, loved, and held by God. God is faithful. He will not leave you whenever something unexpected happens. When you get that, God is there with you, as he was with each of these characters. And much more than that, our faith, our faith, our lives, 
experience every day, whatever that looks like for you, lived out of trust in God, rejoicing with him in what he's doing, and believing in his promises, no matter how small you may feel it is, all of that is a part of God's amazing work in this world. Imagine that. So, brothers and sisters, I encourage you to live a life of faith, to trust, to rejoice, to believe, to hold on to the hope we have in Christ, and to look to him in every situation. Let's pray together. God, we are grateful and we are thankful for the gift of your son. And Lord, we know it's difficult to live a life of faith. We find ourselves in difficult situations. We find ourselves in moments where we don't have the answers. But God, my prayer for each one of my, my brothers and sisters here, each one of my friends here, is that they would see that you are faithful and good, that you are working in their lives, and that the greatest expression of this is that you sent Jesus. And as we just reflected on in Easter, death and resurrection, we find life eternal, now and forever. And now we have a hope, a hope that will not fail. We have a foundation we can stand on. And we have a love that will never leave us. May we hold to that in faith, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.